Okay, um, my voice is going, and I can only promise to answer as well as I can anyway, you know, limited intelligence. So um, we will start in the back and just start moving forward. It's back there. <laughs> Can you speak up, please? The eighth definition of virtue is basically continued persistence or consistent belief in something, even though the other secure epistemological epistemically close. Epistemically close to you do not believe it. Yeah. Um, is there a certain level that you believe that that can actually become a hindrance instead of a virtue? Yeah. And that's part A. That, yes, you do that. Well, I think that's a really good question. I think that there are cases where you probably would say that, wouldn't you? Yes. And so that there's going to be a need. Um, <clears throat> you're, you're going to need faith is going to have to be balanced by or controlled by practical wisdom. And I mean, this is a point from Aristotle: the practical wisdom is the chief of all virtues and has to rule over all. Of them. Go ahead. Uh, part B is if that is your definition and you believe you can put it to a certain point, um, and you continue to insist on. You calling it faith, why not just change it over to being persistent or stubborn in one's beliefs? Because that's a good thing to a certain point, and it would almost completely eliminate one point of contention with nice Pete Bogosian, who was sitting there a minute ago, which would really eliminate if you stop using the word faith, which is a contradictor, not contradictor, but a, a hotbed argument just on that one term. Honestly, it seems like you're creating a uh, a conflict just by your consistency with this sort of knowledge rather than just returning it over to some consistency. Okay, uh, <clears throat> it's the actual thing itself that's more important than what we call it. So if you want to call faith eight, you know, something else, and we all use the word that way, okay. <clears throat> um, but my assertion is that people actually do use the word faith this way as well as all the other ways, this is why we get so confused, we talk past each other all the time. And in many other ways that I didn't bother to list, and you could undoubtedly extend the list. Extend the list. I, I completely agree with you, but at the same time, you get it. It's just like, I know Pete's made the argument a few times about people using faith in ways that it shouldn't be used, and it's actually a problem in society, because it allows people to say that they slip out of certain arguments and get away from uh, the actual point that they're trying to contend. Well, I, faith is not going to, I mean, the use of the word faith is not going to go away. We should try to clean it up. Part of this lecture is a, a tiny little effort to try cleaning it up a little bit, being more accurate in the way we speak to each other, try to understand each other. But this is something that anybody that takes, gets a college education knows. You need to come to terms with your author or your audience. You need to be clear about what it is you're saying. Um, and when you know you are working in an area where there's lots of confusion, it means you, more effort to try to be clear about what you're saying. Um, so, if being clear about what we're saying means using a different word, okay. I'm not persuaded that we must, um, but, you know, I, I could go for that. Let's go over here. Um, I don't really think your examples demonstrate that this uh, definition of faith you have is a virtue, because basically what you're saying is, Faith is this definition of faith is virtue because it's, it's like disagreeing with people who you might uh, otherwise agree with. And so Wagner, he wasn't virtuous because he disagreed with people. He was virtuous because he was right. Like your examples just happened to be people who actually were right. And so like he wasn't virtuous because he disagreed. He was virtuous because like he actually noticed evidence on people that noticed. And Jordan. She wasn't virtuous because she disagreed with people. She was virtuous because she was a hard worker and, you know, like maybe didn't uh, victimize herself or something. So I don't really see how, like, these examples show that, like, disagreeing with people is a virtue. The virtue is that, you know, they paid attention to evidence that other people didn't or that they were determined. I don't think I ever said that disagreeing with somebody is a virtue. Well, believing things other people disbelieve. I mean, that's, that's right. Disagreement. Well, the disagreement comes after the belief. Um, it's obviously not a virtue just to disagree with people. You become argumentative and lose all your friends. Um, <laughs> what I'm saying is, if you're going to have beliefs about things that are important and act in, record, in accord with those beliefs, and if you know that other people, smart people, well-informed people, disagree with you, you have reasons to doubt what you're doing. 
And it seems to me that it's legitimate to say, this is just one way we use the word faith, it is an appropriate way to use the word faith, that you have faith in the thing that you believe in. Now, uh, somebody in between raised the question, well, isn't it possible then to have, to miss it, to have faith in something that's wrong? That's true. In the moral life, there aren't guarantees. I, earlier, I used the example of uh, capital punishment. It seems to me that if you're going to participate in political life actively as a good citizen, there will come questions like that where you will commit yourself to a campaign to do something, to achieve a good, and then it's quite possible 30 years later you will say, I was wrong. I gave a portion of my life away to something that was wrong. And there is no guarantee, I'm sorry, there's no guarantees. If you're going to be involved in the moral life, you have to take the risk that you might be wrong and give away part of your life to something that is evil. <coughs> Back here. I had a, a, a nice uh, uh, feeling about your presentation. It was a really helpful uh, question. You know, this is a philosophy class, and uh, I'm wondering, you, you talked about McIntyre, and there are some other thinkers who have really had that. Descartes' uh, attempt to understand his experience, you know, unmediated, unmediated by his society and by the framework, mm -hmm. the background knowledge of the society, we dismissed that pretty quickly. I mean, uh, this is an important chapter in philosophy. What argument, or you know, I mean, the fact that, that Descartes was speaking in French, you mentioned, mm -hmm. should, should give us pause and make us think perhaps that we can't get outside our society or the immediate sort of world that we grow up in, our family, our culture, our language, and think philosophically on our own as individuals. No, I'm not saying that. Ability, or are we stuck inside the social groups that we grow up in? It's not an either it, or. It's not an eager, either or. McIntyre, McIntyre is sometimes taken to be saying that it's we're, we are, we are uh, entirely um, encapsulated in our traditions. And I don't think that that's a good or fair reading of McIntyre. But whether or not that's true, it's not what I wanted to say. Um, <clears throat> when you participate in a practice, you are given as a gift from the earlier practitioners the, the rudiments of that practice. And you become, over time, a competent practitioner of the practice. And when you're a competent practitioner, at some point, the practice needs to move ahead. And it's only the competent practitioners or the inhabitants of a tradition who can then say, you know, we need to change. Architecture needs to adapt to a new reality. Um, so the fact that we recognize that we have been given all of this we are given the tools to do intellectual work by the people who have come before us doesn't prevent us from them turning back and saying, hmm, there are some things that we need to change. Do we only come from one tradition? Oh, we come from many, of course. And that's and so if we use it well, well, we can use it. Languages and, and become part of us in the cultural world. And draw upon all of them in our community. Sure, we should. But in a way, the McIntyre saying we can't do that. I think McIntyre would say, as soon as I said, sure, we should, he would say, yeah, uh-huh, and how long will you live? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I, it seems an interesting and important question for young people who are beginning to study philosophy, you know, giving it a chance, as it were, to think as an individual, and not merely as a member of a social group. That's what I'm trying to get at. Okay, well, my response would be, um, there is a great deal of self-deception in that. That uh, I think I'm thinking for myself not recognizing how deeply I am formed by the accidental meetings that I have, by my, the, the people who have been around me. If we recognize and are grateful for the things that have been given to us, then we can say we also ought to be a little bit critical of the things that have been given to us. Um, grandma wasn't right about everything. So we ought to inhabit the intellectual traditions that, that make it possible to think and yet move beyond them, be critical of them. And one of the ways in the current world, given the internet, that we can do this is to read other people. We can read across cultural lines much more easy. I mean, Aquinas imagined atheists. I don't think he ever met one, right? 
So uh, we, we have a lot more advantages. We're moving forward. Bob, we're right here. Okay. So <clears throat> my question is two part. So how can you claim that faith is a virtue if suspending critical thought, i.e. believing without evidence, leads you to discriminate against our fellow primates based on biologically acquired characteristics? Did I say um, any of that? Well, I just, it's a two-part question. Okay. So I suspect that you're trying to leave like scriptural claims um, aside from this particular discussion on faith. So then what method do you endorse in order to dismiss the parts of the Bible or scriptures that, that one would find unvirtuous? Um, That's why she's the TA. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're Start, not using read the, faith, read the first part again. Go slowly. Read okay. The first so part again. how how do you claim that faith is a virtue if using faith um, by suspending critical thought? I start going one at a time. I never said that, and, I, and if any people think that faith is suspending critical thought, I disagree with them. Move on. Okay, so that's why my second part. I know that you're trying to separate that mm -hmm. from this discussion. And I'm wondering what method do you endorse in order to dismiss the parts of the Bible and the things that we're trying to separate right now from this discussion? What method are you going to use um, to, to uh, dismiss parts of Scripture or Bible or the discussion that you find unvirtuous? Um, so what method are you using I if it's not I object to the faith? word dismiss, but let's, let's, let's leave that aside. Um, I think that the uh, scriptures are authoritative in what they teach, not in what they say. The Bible says very clearly the earth doesn't move. <laughs> it's not true. The earth does move. So we've now proven that the Bible is false, haven't we? <clears throat> but I'm talking about su subjective claims, maybe not like a specific claim made about the nature of reality, but more so I can be specific. I'm talking about discriminating against homosexuals, mm -hmm. something that most people of faith argue that that is unvirtuous right and i'm wondering what method you're endorsing to dismiss that if you're saying okay i'm not saying that's unvirtuous i'm the type of person of faith that is okay with gay people and i'm not saying that that's a sin well what method are you using then if not faith to you're using independent judgment to decide what is moral or immoral from these scriptures i think um mcintyre's idea of a living uh, tradition is helpful here um Sometimes people have the idea that a religion is uh, a static block carved in granite. Uh, McIntyre suggests that um, a living intellectual tradition, in fact, all living intellectual traditions, have to adjust, have to be self-critical within. Um, I'm a Quaker, so let's take an example that's, I'll give you an example that I like. You give me an example that you like. Um, the, the Christian church beginning in the fourth century under the brilliant leadership of Augustine, and I mean that, he was a genius, adopted what's called the just war theory. I think the just war theory is a theological mistake. It has been for 1,500 years. Um, and I believe and hope that eventually the church is going to get over it. We make mistakes. We struggle with them. There's internal debate. There's growth. This uh, same thing happened in chemistry. We got rid of phlogiston in chemistry and moved on to oxygen, right? Uh, it's possible for an intellectual tradition to be wrong and discover that error and change. So that's kind of a structural overarching, how does the intellectual tradition... Now, your, your question, the specific question, right. is how does this tradition actually deal with scriptural passages having to do with human sexuality? Well, that's a great question, but I think... It will take at least half an hour, and so I'm going to I'm going to move on to others, and we can maybe talk later. But back here, this person right here, yeah, you. Um, so by your definition of virtue, um, like it has to be necessarily good. Um, no, a vir a, Let's be careful about this. A virtue. It, there's a sense in which the virtue is good, yes, but when you believe something that she doesn't believe and you act on it, you are not guaranteed by that that it's virtuous. You have to be right. You might believe that the Aryan people are superior to all other peoples and the German state ought therefore to support them. And she doesn't believe it. It's your faith. That, that doesn't like, affect 
factor into your definition of what faith aid is. Though. That's right. I should have probably, uh, uh, well, no, I should not amend it. Let's go there. Whoops. Um, this is what faith aid is, and I'm suggesting that it's a virtue. It's possible. It's necessary for living the good life. If you're going to be involved in politics, it seems to me that you've got to have faith aid. But, but that doesn't guarantee your right. If you're not right, if you practice faith aid and you're not right, it's not a virtue. That's right. It's not good. That's right. You gambled and lost. So perhaps it should be amended. Well, I don't know. Do you, do you really want guarantees in the moral life? Are there guarantees in the moral life? No, I just want a stricter definition of what faith is if you're going to call it. We've, well, we've been talking in this class about faith is something that you don't need reasons for. And the examples you gave um, for sla like slavery and uh, interracial marriage, we all have good reasons to believe that slavery is bad without the need for faith. We have reasons to believe that interracial marriage is good, or it's at least not bad, regardless of faith. So, I mean, I guess the argument has been sort of, and the discussion has been that faith is almost irrelevant when you have good reasons uh -huh. to believe something. So I, I'm not arguing necessarily that faith is bad, but it's almost irrelevant. When you have good reasons to believe something, uh, take why? My, take my um, assertion just a minute ago, that uh, faith aid is almost necessary for responsible participation in the political process. Mm -hmm. um, take something that you support. A political thing that you support that you would actually campaign for. Okay. You know that there are smarter people than you who are against it. Okay. Do you have good reasons for your position then? Yes. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know where you're. What? Give. What? What? what do you think of the example? Give. Okay. Give okay. You want. You want example. example? I. I. I am for equal marriage rights. You're for, for gay marriage. marriage. You're for, yes. for gay marriage. Fine. Terrific. You know there are smarter people than you who are against it. With bad reasons, yes. <laughs> so that's how I'm supposed to He's against faith, and he's against belief in God, but he's got bad reasons, and I know. Oh, come on. Well, I mean, but that's... Well, I think the thing is, though, is that I think even we see with a lot of people even who are, who are well articulated and who, do, who are intelligent, there's some really smart people who are also really good at rationalizing really bad ideas. That's true, isn't it? So all I'm saying is that these people, the existence of the, such people, give us prima facie reasons for, for doubt. That doesn't. You're you're familiar with the difference between uh, first first at first hand and final, final, thinking whatever. Um, so it's possible that there are people who that you the more you think about it, you think, man. I just don't get it. I mean, these people are really well, they're smart people, they're well informed, they're really trying, and they just don't get it. How could it, how could it be possible? Now, the thing is, I think it would be really, you, you, often we say, we give um, these rhetorical questions, how could anybody possibly do that? And change the rhetorical question into a real one. How do they do that? How do they have that position? Take their, you know, um, there are way too many religious people who just write off atheism as just stupid. And there are way too many atheists who write off religious pe people as just stupid. I mean, good grief. Alvin Planning and Bob Adams love Jesus. Are they just stupid? Mm -hmm. So you said, um, uh, according to you, faith is only virtuous if you're right. Um, correct? More or less. There's a there's a exception there's a problem with that uh, and I I don't want to be careful I want to so I'm still thinking about this okay so um, consider the fixists back to the fixists who opposed Wegener they were sure that the continents didn't move and because they were sure the continents didn't move and they didn't like Wegener they did lots of research to prove that he was wrong now they were wrong but their beliefs 
helped them to do a lot of good theolo uh, not theologic, uh, geological. geological research. So it's possible, and I'm, I'm wrestling with it, it's possible that you could be wrong about something, now, in the area of science especially, and it still be useful, still be helpful. Well, then, then it's more of a faith aid is only uh, virtuous if at least the truth. If it, remember the definition is, the a virtue tends to get the internal goods of practices. What are the internal goods of science? Understanding the world, something like that. And if, if faith aid helps us to get understanding of the world, then it's virtuous. Even, perhaps, when you're wrong. Now, when it comes to the moral examples that we were majoring on a little bit ago, it doesn't seem like, because it seems like one of the, the internal goods of social and political reform is to make the world a better place. And so if you make it a worse place, that doesn't, you know, so we have problems there. But in, so I, I'm struggling with that. Well, it's just my question. Uh, that was, those were just follow-up questions. My question is, so how do we know when people use, when religious people use faith they, according to their religion, how do we know that it is virtuous? Well, you'd have to ask a lot of questions. You'd have to talk with them. How do you know about anybody if her political or religious or scientific beliefs are useful or helpful or attractive? You've got you to get into the details. You've got to get into a lot. You've got to talk more. Just because somebody says, I have faith in God, um, Peter's right about that. Somebody stands up and says, I have faith in God, vote for me. Uh, that's terrible. You've got to have a lot more information than that. But you could also have faith in I mean, faith aid in this definition for atheism as well. And then, how do you know that their faith aid in atheism is a virtuous? Well, you just gotta talk to them. So, how is this? Help, I mean, this definition of faith aid. What what does it do for the argument? Um, how are you using it to defend religion if it can be used for atheism? So far, I haven't talked about religion at all. I, I'm just well. What what's the purpose of enlightening us with this definition? Then? Is to say that faith. Committing to things that people disagree with, that people who you respect disagree with, is part of the good life. You've got to commit yourself and do things. Right here. Um, so, uh, you question faith as believing uh, things other people disbelieve and living in the light of these things. Yes. And you said it has to be things that you don't know. Right, because if you know them, so, so now let's imagine that one of you says, no, 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 the Tigers won last night. Well, that's not faith. I know the, ti the, the, car the Giants won, not the Cardinals. The, the Giants won, and it's, it's, it's a matter of knowledge. It's not a matter of faith at all. So uh, when, usually when I say I know something, I really just mean that I believe it with a high degree of certainty. Um, so I always accept the possibility I could be wrong. So when you yeah. say believing yeah. things that you don't know, what do you mean when you say the word believe? Ah, because you don't have that high degree of certainty, do you? As, as, as I say, typically, faith, typically, <coughs> faith coexists with doubt, sometimes strong doubt. So if I have, if I, um, let's say I uh, believe something, I say there's like 60% certainty I think that I'm right, it's virtuous for me to act on that belief even though I could be wrong. No, it's going to depend on different cases, isn't it? Um, there are times when acting on a 60% likelihood that it's right would be an evil and vicious thing to do. And there are other times failing to act on a 60% certainty <coughs> would be an evil and thing, thing to do. It's going to depend on different cases. Right? I've got two things I want to address. And, uh, one of them is <coughs> As far as going back to the gay marriage issue, it was really easy in the 80s to kind of say that gay behavior leads to the spread of AIDS until we found out that it's actually blood that causes people to get AIDS, the, the transmission of blood between people. So at first thought, it's like gay marriage may be really bad for society. Maybe it would be really good for society because then they would be yeah. monogamous. But um, I think... What you're saying, I'm not sure what you're saying. I guess what I'm thinking is, he said reasons. And I would go to, what are your reasons for having an opinion, any political opinion, would be stronger than what your a faith is? If I've got faith that I'm against gay marriage because of an ancient text, um, that's probably not a real good reason. If I've got faith, that gay marriage is wrong because of all these statistical data that have been shown that it's very harmful to the world as a society or the environment or whatever, name anything. 
fill in the blank. But um, that's a reason. That's a reason to have an opinion, not a faith. And so um, I don't see, it seems to me, if you wanted to have a faith about a political issue, you would want to investigate the reasons that you have the faith in that political issue. Sure. Does that make sense? So on, on capital punishment, if you don't actually do some research to find out whether or not capital punishment deters crime, or whether it, how much it costs, and all these different things that are relevant questions, you ought to research those things. So then it seems that faith has no bearing on it whatsoever. Yeah. It's only your faith in your opinion would continue your research on it, would have absolutely nothing to do with virtue. And also virtue, I would say, is trapped in a time frame because you could say that it was very virtuous for our ancestors to conquer the Indians because if they didn't, we wouldn't be sitting in this classroom right now. Now their mindset, what they were doing is those Indians were savages. And so they were killing them. Genocide was completely virtuous back then. So only looking at it through the lens of our future, us, our present time, which to them would have been future, can we look at that and say their activities were not future, uh, were not good or oh, virtuous? There's uh, so much stuff there. Uh, yeah. Boy. Yeah. Um, a lot of good points. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm a moral realist. I mean, we're trapped in this, this time frame. So there's no real way to know if being agnostic, atheist, religious, any of that, that any of that, there's no way to put virtue on that because according to like your faith, the evidence is out. There is no evidence. The reason that you claim to be able to believe it and coexist is because of the doubt. Um, boy, I'm, I'm really confused by what you're trying to say. Um, it seems to me that you're saying that something was virtuous in the 1840s and it's not virtuous now? Sure, genocide. I, I, if you were in Germany in the 40s, genocide, you agreed with Hitler, genocide would have been completely virtuous. Uh, the point that I, I, I tried to, I hope I make this clear to everybody, that uh, the genocide of the Native Americans was wrong in the 1840s. The wrongness of it was not apparent to some people, which is a tragedy for them and tragedy for the people that killed. But how can you say that's tragedy? We're sitting in this classroom because of it. So I benefited from it. I'm not even making a claim to whether it's possible, wrong or good or not. It's quite possible that we could benefit from terrible things. Um, that's true. That doesn't make them right. Uh, sorry, my, no, wait, wait, you've, you've had to return. My last question is, <laughs> I don't believe that faith is necessarily um, what is needed to hold fast behind an unpopular opinion. Um, but I believe that simple logic will suffice, in essence. Um, if you're talking about a strictly unpopular opinion, everyone else is against you, everyone else believes the contrary, that's a simple argumentum ad populum and a logical fallacy. If you're going to cite um, your contemporaries, peers, people that you respect, people that um, are uh, respected in their um, regions of academia, if they disagree with you, they're obviously, and you're actually right, you know, they're obviously overlooking pieces of evidence that you see, and for me, that really reduces the credibility necessary to build an argumentum ad vericundium behind them. Okay, um, yeah, uh, Peter doesn't see all the truth. If he did, he'd believe in Jesus, so just like I do. Wow. <laughs> I don't know, well, I'm just going with this example. I'm giving him an example of what he was describing. Um, but it seems to me that, um, I need to have an, some humility here. Um, it, it is possible. This, I know this is shocking. I have been wrong in the past. So it seems to me that when I have somebody who is epistemically close to me, somebody who is at a great epistemic distance, samurai warriors of the 17th century, I really don't worry about them very much. Um, but when somebody is epistemically close to me, and disagrees with me. That gives me a prima facie reason to doubt what I believe. It's not an all things considered reason. All things considered, I still believe in Jesus, and I think Peter should too. But uh, I go home and worry about it. You know? uh, just piling up the reasons and thinking that I've got them all lined up. The world is a surprising place. We ought to 
we ought to be willing to say that the world can surprise us and, and change our minds. Um, who knows, after, after all these years, maybe I'll change my mind. On some things, I really doubt it, but, you know. Uh, but I, just, I don't think I will change my mind, but it's possible. And I'll listen to people over here. Um, mine is a direct follow-up to that. So then wouldn't you say that the actual virtue you're showing is of humility and not of faith? Like, I don't understand how faith aid shows anything virtuous when all of the virtuous characteristics of it have to do with humility or um, what the original question, the very first person asked about how you keep on going, like the perseverance. Like, it seems like faith aid is just showing lots of different types of virtues that you just kind of put into it, but they don't really seem necessary for the actual idea. So you're willing to say that perseverance in a, a contested belief is a virtue, and humility is a, is a virtue, but faith is not a virtue. It just doesn't seem like the faith part is necessary. Like, and I guess part of the reason why I think that is because I could practice faith eight, but it has no bearing on any type of religious belief. Like, I could see how humility and perseverance can make me a really good person, live a good yeah. life. We have not said anything about religion. I know we so, haven't, but uh, it so. is an atheism class. Yeah. Okay, so let's make it factual. <laughs> <laughs> this is a moral argument, right? Yeah. There are plenty of people in the press today who make what I think are spectacularly bad mm -hmm. arguments against religious belief on moral grounds. <clears throat> uh, religion is bad because it leads to witch burning and everything else. Um, so I would like to respond with a, a moral argument in chapter 8 in the book, when the book comes out. Uh, I have a deadline on January 10th to get everything done. Um, suppose there is a practice of religion. What would be the internal goods of that? Would, it, would religion be morally useful? Um, I make an argument, which I'm not going to try to give now, that we can say, make affirmative answers to these things. Um, but in this talk, I haven't done any of that. And I, you know, now I've just waved my hand and said, oh, read the book. Um, your, your basic question, though, is a, is a good one. Um, what are the, the virtues? How do they interrelate with each other? Um, if you have humility and perseverance, maybe we don't need to talk about faith eight. Well, um, this is a matter of uh, don't think, look, says Wittgenstein. Um, do people, in fact, talk about faith this way? Um, is this one of the ways that people talk about faith? Of persisting in contested beliefs, and by that persistence, being able to achieve good lives for themselves. I think if you don't have this kind of persistence, this kind of humility, this kind of, now I'm going to say, if you don't have this faith, you're going to bar yourself from the good life in a lot of ways. Over here. So, all thinking about this the entire time, you talk, in your definition of faith, you talk about believing something that other people disbelieve. Well, what if nobody disbelieves you? So let's pick a religion, any religion, something that is not knowable, yeah. right? Yeah. In the sense of having uh, epistemological reasons and yeah, yeah. All right, so we don't know. But let's say everybody in the entire world, everybody, including Pete, believes in this man. Everybody. So we no longer have faith, but we no longer have, but we also don't have knowledge. Right. So Ooh, that's, a, that's a really good question. And, but we can, we can come up with not a, a theoretical one. Actually, you know, um, <laughs> in the medieval period, you can find lots of villages, you know, village whatever. What's your name? Village Catherine in medieval France. Oh. Everybody lives there. Everybody who lives there believes in God. Yeah. Um, do they have faith? I think that by this virtue, by this definition, I think you would say probably not. Probably not. Yeah. Now, but remember what I said at the very beginning. Is this the definition of faith? Explicitly, no. There is no the definition of faith. This is one that I'm arguing is a virtue. Now, the kind of faith that these people have would be somewhat related to what I've been talking about. And whether or not it's a virtue is an issue for another day. But yeah, I think that's an interesting question. What about if you have a, a isolated community, either isolated in time or in space, uh, socially isolated, where everybody has the same beliefs? 
Um, Other than boring. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, uh, we may think that we know these cases, but actually, if we did some historical research, we might find that there are fewer of them than we might. Well, that's the, I wasn't, yes, there are historical um, instances, and one very obvious historical, very large historical instance was the movement from shallow time, not understanding deep time. In archaeology and, and uh, anthropology, they talk about when people went from <coughs> only knowing right now, it was this way my grandfather's time, so it's been this way forever. Mm -hmm. And that shift to knowing deep time, to thinking about it was thousands, millions, billions of years ago, it was a very big shift in people's thoughts. But for a very, very long time, most people only understood shallow time. So, I'm going to go way back there. Um, when you were kind of reiterating this gentleman's example, you said that if Peter had all the facts, then he should have believed in his, but I feel like it's problematic for all the reasons. But. Well, wait a second. If, if it is true that Jesus is the Lord of the universe, and if Peter had all of the facts, shouldn't he think that? If that were true, like I mean. Well, then what you have problems with is the ifs. So that's, I mean, the, um, I recognize that most, maybe most people in the room, or certainly many people in the room, wouldn't agree with those those conditionals. But if the conditionals were true, then it's unproblematic. If that were actually true, yes, you should believe it. But why does his virtue matter to you? Why should he believe what you believe? You get what I'm Like, why does that have any bearing on your own life? You said that he should believe it because it is true. Well. We should all strive to believe the truth, right? But we're, I don't know if I'm tracking the question at all, but we are stuck in this situation where we're trying to find out what the truth is. But it seems like you have a personal stake in him believing the same thing. You're saying well, no more than he has a personal stake in me believing the right thing, and no more than you have a personal stake than she believes it. We all want, when, this is something Polanyi said, when we um, affirm something, we do so personally, with universal intent. If you don't believe, if you don't make it with universal intent, you really don't believe it. Peter <coughs> has to, when he makes his assertions, he makes them with universal intent because he thinks that they are true. He thinks that all right thinking people should think this way. Well, yeah, if they're right thinking and if they are true, we should think that way. The problem is we're stuck in the situation where we're trying to discover what is really true. Right here. I'm, I'm kind of interested, you've got the eight different de definitions of faith, and when you started talking about them, you started talking about the vice, vice and virtue, uh -huh. some, some are vice and some are virtue, and you said that faith aid is, is a gamble. Yeah, um, on the, when we were dealing with the moral issues, right, then we had the one where we talked about the scientific examples, and there, it might be possible that faith aids would be a virtue even if you're wrong, so it's kind of tricky, but well, go ahead. Okay, so, well, my question is, what, not, um, not just on the faith aid, to what degree are, uh, are these even to a degree? Uh, is there a degree of vice and virtue to each of them? Are they either, either or? Are they, they gamble to, to be either a vice or a virtue? Is there uh, uh, no, I, 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 Say it again. I'm, I'm not following the question. I'm sorry. So, not, not uh, of all these faiths, of all the faith ones. Yeah, yeah, one, yeah. Uh, you said you said some were some were vice. Oh yeah. Some were virtue. Yeah. Uh, are, you, are you? Well, now let, let's be, be clear about what I actually said, because you're probably guessing at what I actually believe, and, and you might be right. Some of them I think really are vices. I think one and two are vices. Okay. When it comes to faith three, um, I think the matter is is pretty complicated. Blackburn is clearly against faith three. But I think William James is, if you read William James carefully, he's got a pretty good argument because he's very careful. He says, look, there are times when ordinary research will not decide a matter. And you have to decide, force choice situations. And and it really is important. It's not just, you know, are pumpkins nice or not. Um, in those very limited situations, he says, 
there is a, a sense in which you can say, I choose to believe. So on faith three, is it a vice? Blackburn says, absolutely. Um, I kind of agree with him, but uh, William James is fairly persuasive. If you limit it down to a small group of cases, maybe it could be not so bad. And, and so going through the whole list, some of them I disapprove of. Faith 8, Faith 7, I pretty much do approve of. The others, I don't. Between Faith 3 and Faith 4, there's clearly a, a uh, no, wait a second, Let's see if I get this right. Yeah, between 3 and 4, you have a clear contradiction. So um, you can't really approve of both of them. Uh, right behind you, right there. Yeah. Um, is the, if someone um, is aware of uh, Pascal's wager and they accept faith on, if they accept religious faith um, on the basis of that, is that a manifestation of faith three? Because they believe they'll be rewarded? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, many people have asked whether you can actually do what Pascal says. You know, and Pascal recognizes this, right? He says, you figure out the odds, and it's going to be good for you, so you believe in God. But you can't just make yourself, you can't just choose to believe that this is coffee in here. <laughs> right? I'm not telling you what's in here. <laughs> believe that there is coffee. No, you can't do that. You can't just believe. But, but Pascal recognizes this, and we don't have direct control of our beliefs. We do have indirect control of our beliefs. And so he gives all of this advice about what you should do to inculcate faith in yourself and all that kind of stuff. Um, Can we, there's a lot of people asking questions over yeah, here that have yeah, had their hand up a really long time. I, I, it's easy to get just locked These in on one side. Right you, there. right here. Yeah. Okay, uh, just two, two quick things. Uh, just to clarify, when you're talking about faith eight, are you saying that your belief is based on evidence that you choose to prefer over other evidence, or is it that it is based solely on your belief and that when compared to evidence someone else might have that you're choosing to disregard that? This is a really good question because it segues, segues so nice from the other one. Um, what what uh, Descartes said, remember, is that when, when you're in this situation and you think it would be good for you to believe in God, but you can't really get yourself to believe in God, what do I do? Um, Take yourself off to mass. Start saying prayers. Light candles. Do things. Pay attention to some of the evidence. And if by paying attention to that evidence, you will become convinced. So that's what th that relates to your question. Um, how do you notice that I've got this belief that uh, uh, capital punishment ought to be eliminated? I came to it by examining the question, looking at a lot of evidence. Um, have I looked at all the evidence? No. Um, will I ever look at all the evidence? Just two minutes to go? Okay. Uh, I will never look at all the evidence. So I recognize that I'm committing myself to a position and acting on it even though I have not examined all the evidence. Is that vicious? No, I think it's virtuous. It can be. Last one, right here. No, wait, wait is, is there some injustice here? Yeah, you, you have had your hand up a lot. Let's go for you. Do atheists have faith? No. According to faith, we do have uh, faith. That's right. Peter believes that there is no God. He's not an agnostic. Well, but he, so this isn't really what we should be arguing about in the uh, atheist <coughs> class. It's, it's uh, either belief in God or not believe in God. Well, the, um, I mean, then. My response is that I apologize for not bringing what you expected me to talk about. <laughs> one more. No, this guy's had too many. You, you're pointing to him. He has a question. So, um, so just for clarification, faith eight uh, does consider con like you know contradictory evidence. Is that correct? Yes, I. I so the fact that I know that Peter doesn't believe in God confronts me with reasons to be doubtful. My faith in God lives with doubt constantly. Not all, well, that's overstating it. There are lots of times when it doesn't, but. So, um, I think the problem is that in society, we see faith one through three as the most prevalent. And, um, and so that, so, I mean, faith eight probably isn't what we are going to be able to have 
disseminated. Um, and, it, and like whether it's a virtue or not. So what's the solution to this? Probably not more faith. No. <laughs> Disseminate it. Tell the truth. All right, I got a pause. Big round of applause.